Hello and welcome to your daily Detroit. It is Friday, April 22nd, 2022. So many twos, Devin. So many twos. So many twos, but it's uh, great to be talking to you, Jer, and uh, finally getting a dose of some decent weather. Oh, absolutely. Now, (laughs) uh, what do you have uh, in your hand, Mr. Devin O'Reilly? Well, I've really been liking this uh, Unity Vibration, which people may be familiar with. They do uh, kombucha and kombucha beer. So this is my this is my health drink, as I'm calling it. It is beer. It is definitely it's 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 a beer, but it's a kombucha beer. So it's I think extra fermentation because kombucha is fermented anyway. But they're local. They're out of Ypsilanti. So it's Unity Vibration kombucha beer. They've got different flavors. I've got a kombucha pale ale in my hand right now with. Double hop kombucha with juniper and fresh grapefruit rind, Ooh. which is delicious. So do you count this as healthy? Yes. I mean, maybe we need to ask uh, Dr. Paul for an official consultation. But I mean, <laughs> if, if, if the option is, uh, you know, a stout or a double IPA or a kombucha beer, this tells me, I'm, unless the branding is good, it says raw, vegan, and gluten-free on it, which are all buzzwords for being healthy as far as I'm concerned. But how do I know? <laughs> Well, I made a little bit of a trip before we got recording out to the west side and saw our old friends at the Narrow Way Cafe. Oh, great. Great spot. Now, I don't have coffee. No, I would think that would that's what you'd get at Narrow Way. I, I know, what but here's have? the thing, and this is hashtag not sponsored. None of this is sponsored. I went for something theoretically. Is it healthier? I don't know. I went for the wild berry smoothie. Mm, that's debatable, Jer. I mean, coffee has like zero calories, so I'm a black coffee uh, drinker, so I can always say that's healthier. Berry smoothie, I mean, you got your natural sugars. It sounds delicious. Oh, is it, it like a cream-based? or? Yeah, it's definitely got the darker berry vibe. I'm very much into it, but I'm a fan of that stuff, unlike Engineer Randy, who cannot stand a blueberry. Yes, we do know that. All right, very berry, Jerry. <laughs> well played, sir. Well played. Today, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to open up the mailbag. We have not done this in a long time. And I don't think you and I have ever done this, Devin. No, Jerry, I'm excited. A mailbag episode. This is this is going to be fun. I hope you, we got to get some sound effects. So you're rustling a mailbag over there and pulling out letters. Yeah, yeah. We need like a jingle, you know, like the old David Letterman show or whatever. Yep, exactly. <laughs> and we've got actually quite a few questions to go through. And I think some of them are very recent. Uh, some of them, you know, what strikes me is that when people find the show, they end up going into the archives. So sometimes we get a question from something that we did like three months ago (laughs) and they're like, where did that come from? And like, oh yeah, this is a podcast. You can listen anytime you want. What I'm also looking forward to, and just again, to kind of give people an idea of how we're doing this is uh, this episode is going to be a little bit more, I think, candid or behind the scenes. You know, for instance, FYI, Jer, for people that don't know, it's not like you and I sat down and combed through these and decided on what our answers are going to be. We're just open in the bag and we're going to answer some questions. For sure. For sure. Now, first off, we're going to talk about breakfast. So a listener wanted to make mention of a breakfast place in Detroit that Robin and I did not mention because in a podcast recently, we talked about kind of a lack of breakfast spots. Now, I'm not going to speak for Robin, but I, I can say that I think we were kind of doing it in the frame of right around the old Chung spot, which is Peterborough and Cass. Uh, he said that there are definitely more breakfast places to check out and that we should check out one near him called Le Petit Dejeuner, offering a family style menu, he says, and the best blueberry pancakes I may have ever had. Uh, They say that, you know, although the food might take a little bit longer, it's definitely worth the wait. He says that there is a small stage for live Sunday brunch music uh, and says it feels very Detroit and he likes it quite a bit and uh, for us to hopefully retract or uh, relook at our lack of Detroit breakfast spots. And I have some thoughts to that, but first, Evan, what do you think? Well, first of all, it's a great example. I think Le Petit Dijonet is a, is a great little kind of, I guess maybe you could call it hidden gem. It's over there in Rivertown area in Jefferson, a little bit out of the way of the central business district or you know more in like a warehouse area. Looks like a cool spot. I haven't had a chance to really go and explore the menu there, but uh, I have some friends who have and said it's really good. You know, Jared, because I take brunch so seriously, I think it's important to differentiate when we're talking about a breakfast in Detroit versus brunch in Detroit, because Hmm. there are no shortages of brunch in Detroit. But, you know, for me, a brunch usually happens on the weekends and it pretty much has to involve booze. Otherwise, you're eating breakfast. So from a breakfast standpoint, it is tough. And you were talking about Cass and Peterborough area. By far, the best 
place to get breakfast in that area is Honest John's. They're open mm, mm-hmm. like literally the closest thing to 24 hours. I think it's like something crazy, like 6 or 7 a.m. to like 2 a.m. You know, you can carry out, you can eat inside. The food is always good. You know what you're getting. That menu doesn't change. To me, like as, as much as people may not consider that, I mean, Honest John's is a top notch breakfast spot in Detroit. I don't think that there is a dearth of breakfast spots in the overall city. I mean, you could even mention stuff like The Click, which is legendary on Jefferson, but it's not open on Sundays. No. So it's not really a brunch option and they don't do booze, but that's a heck of a breakfast option, especially if you want a diner brunch. Yeah, more of the, I mean, greasy spoon. I hope that's not a derogatory term in any way, but I mean, think about Hudson Cafe has been around uh, forever over on Woodward. They were really one of the first kind of storefronts on Woodward that became a destination. So we got to give Hudson Cafe a shout out, but it is tough. And a lot of the places, Jared, when I was looking at some of my old favorites, even prior to COVID, a lot of those breakfast places changed the hours and aren't really breakfast places anymore. Now you still have Dime Store. We should, we should give them a shout out. Dime Store is still great for breakfast and brunch. And, you know, I want to throw an RIP to what was the best breakfast place in the city, Parks and Rec Diner. Oh yeah, that's right. You know, I have an unused gift card from them. Oh, Jer, if only, if only, if only you could have cashed that in one last time. I mean, right? it really was. It was the it was the best breakfast spot slash brunch spot in the city. It was a small place. That space is up for lease now, so too bad. But let's focus on the positive. There are still places to get some good breakfast. What about? Let's. I think we can do one from each side, Jer. So, for instance, outside of the city, over in the Gross Points area, there's a popular place that I believe has expanded, Jagged Fork. Yeah, Jagged Fork is really popular. I know that uh, Fletcher will go there sometimes. He likes that spot. Uh, Jagged Fork's been around for a while. I've had food there a few times. Uh, there's also like uh, the Glass Onion and Allen Park, which has a good breakfast. Uh, kind of like unassuming, you know, in that kind of like Allen Park kind of downtown area. But that can be tr- pretty tasty. You know, within the city, too, you've got uh, the Sherwood Grill. Because, you know, I used to be over in the university district. I can't right. forget. I can't not shout out the Sherwood Grill. Lots of people like the Sherwood Grill. When you're talking about brunch and that difference between breakfast and brunch, that's where I think a place like La Dolce Vita can step up because they don't really do a breakfast thing during the week, but they do a heck of a brunch, especially when it warms up. Yeah, pajama brunch. I, I hope they still do pajama brunch. They used to do that on Saturdays and Sundays, and uh, they would do it outside, inside. La Dolce Vita, great spot. Oh, we're in Dearborn in the new uh, the new Ford development, as we call it here. We have a new place. It's called Avenue Brunch House. I'll tell you what, Jer, I haven't even been able to get in there yet. I've only done carry out. It's so packed. It gets, it's probably the most crowded restaurant in the city right now on the weekend. Really? Um, yeah, they do like the decadent, like, you know, over the top strawberry cereal, waffles and pancakes and all sorts of like Instagrammable wild stuff. I mean, probably too sugary for me, but like people love it. It has a huge following on, on Instagram and social media. Avenue Brunch House. I'm going to go there and take a picture. I've only, Like I said, I've only been able to do carry out because it's so darn crowded during the weekend. But that's a new offering over in uh, Dearborn. Now, I've only had the pastries out of there. Uh, have you had breakfast at the Great Commoner over in your side of town? Yeah, yeah. No, that's another good one. We had two top-notch breakfast places in the last year. Great Commoner is awesome. And that, in addition to the, the Matt Neo pastries, you know, from Canal and, and such, from that fame that they have there, they also have Really nice breakfast offerings, breakfast sandwiches, avocado toast, some different kind of egg, tomato, kind of shushushka type dishes. That's a really good breakfast spot that uh, also can get a wait on the weekend. So if you're going to go, make a reservation. We've spent a few minutes on this topic, and I know that we haven't hit every spot. So make sure to email us, dailydetroit at gmail.com. We want to know your favorite breakfast spots to check out and brunch spots. Yeah, exactly. And I think after this conversation, Jared, nobody can say that they don't know any breakfast spots in Detroit. All right, let me grab something else. Here's what's next. This is from Bill. Why do you hate cars so much? You have Eric on sometimes talking about Eric Tritko (laughs) on sometimes who clearly loves cars, but you don't always seem excited about them. And then you talk about bikes and scooters a lot. This is Detroit. What are you doing? Well, I mean, Jared, the car to... uh person ratio at Daily Detroit is pretty low for an organization. I do That's have true. To say. That's true. Although we have we have boosted it a little bit. I mean, people may or may not know. Listen, I I when I moved to the city for five years, I was carless the whole time. I thought I could I thought I could do carless in Detroit. I felt like if I was living downtown, I didn't need a car. 
turned out to be true. It also allowed me to get a nicer place downtown because I didn't, didn't have car or parking to worry about. So that was great. But I recently now <laughs> have gone back to uh, needing a car. Just the lifestyle has changed. And so uh, I have a car again. I don't hate cars. I have one. It's nice. But we want to encourage other forms of transportation. Everybody knows about the cars, Jer, right? We want to try and promote other forms of transportation. Well, for sure. And here's the other thing. I'm about the future and the new a lot, right? Like, I'm also in the history, of course. But I look at the future and the new and where things are going. And it is clear to me, you know, I have a friend of mine that recently started a business uh, a couple of years ago. And they're an engineer and they don't have a job anymore at Ford because they don't need this kind of engineer because they're not going to be innovating with that anymore. Like hmm. the writing is on the wall. And for me, I go, okay, this is where things are going. Now, do I think that, that you know, gas cars are going to be off the road like tomorrow? Absolutely not. But I do see where things are going. And that's for me is like, I look at Detroit and a city of the future and where can we be positioned instead of letting this next opportunity that we are so well suited for around, you know, this whole quote unquote mobility space, letting that get out from under our fingers because we're sitting here going, well, I don't understand it or I wouldn't do it. Well, just because I wouldn't do it doesn't mean that other people are. Yeah, exactly, Jerry. You make a good point. I mean, realistically, car is becoming an outdated term. Ford has been intentional about saying that they're not going to have, they're not going to sell cars in a few years. And I forget, they've said the year and I don't have it off the top of my head. But if you look at it, outside of the Mustang, which is a sports, you know, a sports vehicle, a sports car. Ford's not selling cars anymore. It's all vehicles. You know what I mean? It's all kind of multi-use, different kinds of vehicles. Think about the Ford lineup. The fusions are gone. The focuses are gone. Um, so car, uh, Ford's getting out of the car business, so to speak. And GM's moving in that direction as well. Mm. This is a related question now that I'm digging around here. This is from Michael. Uh, this was from the Stefan Tonger Electrion conversation that I had. Do you remember when I did that one about the electric roads? Yes, I was very interested in it because it's close to home for me. Yeah, yeah. So the question is, why, when we don't have smooth roads, do you think we are encouraging the development of electrified roads? Shouldn't we get the basics right first? It's a very good question. I think the answer is we have to try and do both, right, Jared? If all we do is try and catch up, if you know, you look at it as we're so far behind the eight ball in terms of the rest of the country, and let's not even talk about globally, but we're so far behind the rest of the country in, within in our roads, we'll never catch up. So what Detroit has kind of done, and this goes for a couple different transportation models, we're kind of skipping the middle. We're, sk we're skipping some of this in favor of going to that next generation of transportation, whether that be the future roads, future of cars and autonomy. If anything, Detroit has kind of said, look, we're going to be behind the eight ball forever on this traditional stuff. Let's skip that a little bit and let's focus on some really new ways that we can be a leader in the mobility and transportation space. I mean, I'm not saying we're letting all the roads crumble. Obviously, we'll try and fix them. But I think, you know, we're not going to get to a point where we have an A grading or probably even a B grading on our roads. Or a C. But we can do. Or a C, right? Yeah, or a C. What we can do is have some of the most innovative stretches of road in the country and be a leader there. And I think that's the thought process to why we're why we're doing that. Well, Michael, I would invite you to listen to that conversation again. And, and here's why. If you read between the lines, this is an R&D project. Like this isn't taking all of Michigan Avenue and switching it over. If you read between the lines, this is you have a giant parking lot at a fa at a delivery facility and you're going to park all your vehicles and they're going to charge overnight while they're parked and no one has to worry about cables or like and as somebody who owns an electric vehicle, the little clips on the end, I've had to replace that twice already. That's annoying. And if you think about so much scale and so many people in their busy times, it's a whole lot easier to just have a worker park it on the parking spot and then the computer just takes over and charges it. Also, you're looking at parking spots for if you are going to say, I, I think about like a, a downtown Royal Oak, a Detroit, a Dearborn, a Gross Point. You're running in really quick at the meter and underneath is a little charging pad and you don't have to plug it in and you have a thing connected and then you just juice up as you go. The scale of this, they were talking about what? I think a mile, right, Devin? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a mile. This is an R&D project. This is not a tomorrow we're redoing Woodward with this. Right. This is a a small scale project, but it is focusing on, again, the future of roads. I think it's going to blow people's minds over the next few years, what people see in Corkdown. Ford's look at that campus is very different than, say, how GM and other automakers do their R&D, where it's kind of like behind a fence and the public doesn't really see it. With this campus being so public, 
it's going to have that like very entrepreneurial feel of crazy things and ideas coming out of there that, you know what? Not all of them are going to work. In fact, the vast majority of them are not going to work. But that's where we're, it's going to be a hotbed and a test bed to kind of find like the next things. And it's really important to do that here because of weather. I mean, how much technology works really great in Las Vegas, but you take it to Detroit or Chicago or something and it runs into that brick wall of weather. You're right, Jerry. And that's why you see some of these companies that are testing their autonomous vehicles on kind of the smoothest roads in Arizona and New Mexico. They're doing it because they can test the technology very easily there. But there comes to a point in any of those scenarios where they need to test it on more unforgiving terrain and elements. And that's when you really have to test any kind of autonomous or electrified vehicle on worse conditions and in worse conditions. All right. Anne asks, why Detroit City FC? So we're changing gears <laughs> here with this one. Of all the sports in town, why are you covering them? What made you do that? What drew you to them? And why them and not the Lions? Meaning basically like, you know, football is huge in this town. We had a conversation with Matt Friedman about how big football is. You know, the USFL, the Michigan Panthers don't even play in Michigan, but because the USFL is owned by Fox Sports, they get a lot of media coverage. Why are we doing Detroit City FC? I mean, I'm kind of asking myself this one, but uh, I know, Devin, why don't you kind of add a little bit of flavor how you, lo you look at it? Because you're not the guy who covers DCFC. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm kind of the farthest removed from the, the DCFC crowd, even though we are uh, Daily Detroit is the unofficial DCFC uh news source in the state and in the region, you have to find your lane. I mean, there's plenty of people you, you, you can, you can talk lions literally all friggin' day. If you turn on 97, one or the sports stations, all they'll talk about is lions and they'll pepper in some tigers during the season and some pistons. A, there's not a lot to, to say about those teams. We're in a uh, dearth of a lot of uh, unhappiness and losing with all of our sports teams. So there's really not a great sports team to talk about here, but guess what? The best sports team we have in the state really is you could argue maybe a Michigan or Michigan State team, but it's DCFC this year. Yeah, I mean, I love soccer. I am newer to the sport in the last, you know, like 10 years or so. Uh, baseball was originally my jam, but I watch Premier League. I, you know, I am a fan of uh, Nottingham Forest over there on the other side of the pond. I, I like the sport, and I think there is so much potential for growth and also such a great community that is just so much fun to talk about and be a part of. And you know, it's just a natural fit for Fletcher, who his background for years has been grinding it out doing local soccer journalism. And if it can't work here, you know, people say like, oh, well, I want to get it on this outlet or that outlet. Well, for us, it's like, all right, you know what? We're going to go in there and talk about something that we care about. And at the end of the day, when you care about something and you're interested in it, I think it's better content than when it's overly scripted and, oh, well, this is what the ratings point will do. I mean, that's part of the reason why we're doing a podcast and a local newsletter, because we cover local things. We don't have to do what some, you know, corporate owner in, you know, whatever, Virginia, New York, whatever, tell us to do, because this is our ship and we enjoy it. And it is just an absolute fun time. It's just something for me that I get excited about and I love talking about. And, and, and in fact, I used to do some sports journalism work and sports production work and things like that. So it's kind of good to like wear that hat again, but do it with a different angle and, and a fresh angle. Yeah. I mean, we talk about what we know. And at the end of the day, we sure we could, you know, you and I could uh, BS about the Tigers and the Pistons and, but you're not going to hear anything, you know, so much more insightful than you would get in any other network or station. And most of them don't know what they're talking about either. Let's be honest. So no. we're trying to do something where we're talking about what we know where we're experts in. And when you come to Daily Detroit, you can hear something unique, unique takes, unique insight into a particular sports team. So I think that, that's that's the angle there. Oh, for sure. And to be clear, Fletcher Sharp is the expert. I won't speak for him, but I, you know, I just kind of shared like how I look at it. All right, this one is from Anonymous, just kind of dropped off at our contact form. Your workload has got to be crazy. I can't get one podcast out a month and you get them out pretty much every day and a newsletter. How do you do it? <laughs> That's more for you, Jer. I just come on once a week, so I, it's not so difficult for me, but uh, you're the one grinding uh, behind the scenes. I think many hands make light work. 
I love podcasting. I love like independent media. I love creators. But like most of the creators you see that are growing have teams. For me, what I realized was is even if I were to do a weekly show, you want to have other people involved. It is, I think it's kind of folly, this whole thing that you think you can do it all by yourself. And uh, honestly, like it's a great way to produce media because it's too difficult to do it alone. And although a lot of times, I mean, this is my, this is my thing. This is what I do because I think there is something special here. It's about a team. And if you ever want to not send me an anonymous note, I will gladly share some of my tips. Uh, big things are have systems, make sure that you limit your travel time whenever you can and like plan out your day and uh, have fun with it. And, and here's the other thing. Don't go too long. Like I know this podcast is going to be a little bit longer this episode than we normally do, but don't go too long. Like the, the world has a lot of three hour podcasts. Too many. <laughs> and that isn't to knock any individual creator, but you're likely not the best one at that. And I know I'm not. I know that if I did three or four hours a day, it would be very challenging because it's challenging to get 20 minutes out a day. Very few people in this world have enough interesting stuff to say to fill three hours a week or more. So, I mean, let's just be honest. Yeah. And I also want to stay all local, right? So I could fill that, but then I'd have to start wandering off. And part of the mission of this is to be local. And if it is a, a larger national or global story, have a local angle. Everything's got to have a local tie. And I think that's the biggest thing when I talk to PR people you know, they'll send me pitches and whatever. And it's like, I don't really care if it's not here, you know, and that's different than most outlets where 40, 50, 60% of it can be filled by wire copy. And I get the value in that. Like I get why it drives traffic, all the other stuff. I don't want to do what everyone else is doing. That just seems kind of boring. And if I was going to do that, then I'd go do what everyone else does. So Ed wonders if businesses pay us when we feature them, because we'll talk to a lot of business owners. We'll do something quick when some place opens, like we did the thing with Breadless. People have that question, Devin. And I mean, people have even said, you know, oh, well, you got to pay the bills and have the person on. The hard truth is, is that uh, unless you hear from us that it is a paid segment, we do not get paid for any of that. We do not get paid by those people. No. And that goes into our one of the earlier questions about kind of how we how we decide topics and what makes us fun and what makes us unique. No, we'll let you know if we're being paid to, to talk about like something. Like the Challenge Both Detroit the, thing. We were extremely clear about that. Right. And I was happy to talk about it because like I said, I was an alumni. But by, you know, 99% of the time, if we're talking about stuff we like, I mean, literally, Jer, my relationship with you and Daily Detroit started when I was just kept telling you about all the new places in Detroit that I love to check out and and uh, and love to kind of talk about. So that's all it really is. I mean, it started there and it really is just if, if there's a place we really like, we want to talk about it and give them a shout out. And that's where it starts. Membership and personal support makes up the base of what we do. And it's very important. It will be important going forward. But yeah, you're probably going to see some clearly marked ads because in order to grow this thing, you know, we took a survey. We, we sent one out. We learned a lot about what we did. We did a flash survey with our email newsletter, which has been growing like gangbusters. And it was a very small percentage of people who are willing to pay for any sort of local news. And so if people aren't willing to pay, then the money has to come from somewhere. And it seems like ads are going to end up being a bigger part of what we do than we anticipated. And we have some demand for it. And we're definitely like taking slots that make sense. I mean, we're not just going to do anything and we're going to always prioritize stuff that has a local presence first. That's something that uh, we've had to navigate. But like you said, Jerry, rest assured, we'll, we'll always stick to our guns and uh, we'll talk about things that whether they're paid or not, we'll let you know. And there'll also be stuff that we actually don't mind talking fondly about. All right. Well, we made it through the mailbag for this edition. If you've got Ooh. more questions, dailydetroit at gmail.com. Devin O'Reilly, I appreciate you help sitting with me and uh, helping answer these questions. Yeah, it was great to do my first mailbag with you, Jer. God, we're going on or we're getting close to a thousand episodes and uh, you and I have uh, never done a mailbag before. It's crazy. Which reminds me, I don't have the date yet, but it will be a Friday happy hour that we will be at a location for celebrating a thousand episodes. I don't know if we're going to do like a live podcast. I think more of a happy hour meet and greet discussion, talk amongst yourselves, do something fun with it. But I'm lining up the venue right now. It's kind of looking like a Friday happy hour and it's going to be after we're at episode. I think this is going to be in like the nine sixties. 
So we're getting there like month, month and a half ish. All right. Well, with that, we are done for today. I'm Jer Stays. And I'm Devin O'Reilly. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your letters. Thanks to Cheyenne Nocerini, Fletcher Sharp, Randy Walker, who I hope you get better soon. We love you, man. Take care of each other, and we'll see you around Detroit.